Hello and welcome to another episode of Linux Lads. This is episode 119 or 119. I am Connor and today I'm joined by Mike. Say hello, Mike. Hello, hello. So the other two are absent, so it's just the two of us. It's just myself and Mike. Mike, you have been battling with Windows as a guest OS in Boxes. Um, For people who are not familiar, Boxes is a virtual machine manager, kind of like VirtualBox or VMware Fusion or something like that. If you have used those uh, pieces of software, then Boxes is kind of a more simple version of that. But um, I've never actually tried Windows in it. So what what has been your struggles with Windows in Boxes? I think uh, the struggle is mostly Windows-based. So Boxes, as you said, super intuitive. It's if you think about the whole GNOME way of doing things, Box is, I think, one of the applications that's, that is the be- best example of how good it can be. Because they, if you compare it to VirtualBox, they obviously removed a lot of the features. It looks, uh, not features, but a lot of the stuff that you don't want to set up if you just want to run a VirtualBox. Sorry, a virtual machine. They, uh, It has got a nice, tidy UI, and it's super intuitive. And if you do need, um, like some very super, super needed features or, you know, you need to tweak this configuration and or not, it actually enables you to, uh, go straight into the XML configuration for each machine and you can do a lot of stuff that way. So, uh, it's nice at hiding the complications or the complexities of running virtual machines, but it still enables you to do things. Now, Windows, installing Windows in it is like installing pretty much any other system from an ISO. You just download the ISO from Windows or from Microsoft's website and start a new virtual machine, give it enough memory and disk space. Obviously, because it's Windows, it needs more disk space than your regular Linux distro, depending on what you want to do with it anyway. And um, it, it, you know, the installation process of Windows is the same as, uh, like any other Windows installation process, I'd imagine. It's Windows 10, by the way, I forgot to mention, although uh, Boxes mislabeled it as Windows 11. <laughs> I think there is a way to install Windows 11. I once managed. It needed some hacks to the Windows register or something. Not worth it. I, I need it, I need it for an uh, assignment, right? So I have an assignment that needs to be done on Windows. And also, because the college uh, uses Turnitin and Turnitin, which is like an academic anti-cheat, doesn't like PDFs, uh, they say you have to do it in Word. Now I can do, I can get Word in macOS or I can just, uh, run it on Windows as well. But anyway, basically I have Windows running in GNOME boxes and it runs as well as Windows would. In fact, it actually runs better on this particular laptop than on bare metal because Windows has that got, uh, I could never get uh, the touchpad working on Windows on that laptop, but obviously if it's running in the in GNOME boxes, then the hypervisor takes care of all of that, and it just it just works, right? Uh, my problem with Windows is, and this is probably nothing to do if it's running hypervised or on bare metal, is just it's not compatible with uh, with me for some reason. I made some note, and I think my Biggest issue is with things that I expect to work on Linux and applications that I expect to work in a certain way. And then in Windows, I just can't make heads or tails. So for example, I uh, wanted to have a folder on the Linux host where there would be a document. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to edit the document because it has to be in Word. It's a Word document, so I mounted the folder for the shell for the uh, option in uh, in GNOME boxes. It, it that took some doing, but eventually I made it work, and I could create file in there. And I created the file, I edited it in Word, I saved it in Word. Then the next day I came back to it after restart. It opened, but read only. And no matter what the fuck I do, no, nothing I can do about it, it changes that Word document for to for me to be editable and it's i don't know what what is happening there's a trust center in word uh it seems to be it seems to enable me to run things to 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 be able to toggle things to 
uh, not to be read only, but it just does doesn't it doesn't seem to work. So there's one thing. Then you have the whole uh, switching between de- virtual desktops that I don't know who designed it at Microsoft, but they need to they need to look at it again. It's not working. It, it's just rubbish. So for for your shared folder, um, I mean this is probably how I would use it. But let's so so for for your course for your academia, it has to be a officially verified, sanctioned Word document. So LibreOffice or something wouldn't work. Um, I'd imagine you in your case, your your idea would be okay. I'm going to do ninety ninety five percent of what I want to do in LibreOffice, and then um go into the virtual machine with the shared folder and then touch it up in in word so that way it's an officially blessed and sanctioned um word file because word was the last program that officially saved it and then emailed it off that's prob- that's my interpretation of, of where you're going i could be completely wrong no so i never never used libreoffice because i not just i don't hate just word i also Hate writer. I don't like. I don't like um, word processors. They just don't gel with me. I, uh, you know, LibreOffice writer is better than Word. But because I was already working in Windows and uh, the university kindly provided Word document, I uh, started everything in in Word. And also because for this particular subject, uh, they mentioned that style of the document will can lose you grades, right? So if it's a bit off, if it doesn't look super professional, you get get your you know you could lose a little percentage here and there and i've had a really tough time redoing everything so if i I, i've started before documents in libreoffice and then open them in word and try to do just you know thinking well i'm just gonna have to edit a few things i'm sure it's just gonna be a few formatting issues here and there it was all over the place right that's not what happened i i started the document in in word in microsoft word and i started it from windows and it saved to the network drive you know the z whatever it, the network drive which is how uh gnome boxes shares folders so it's actually stored on the linux box but it's some kind of a dev or some whatever right and when i restarted everything and came to it next day it opened but i couldn't save it i could just i just couldn't edit it i could save it to a different place in 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 on the windows desktop and it that would work but it wouldn't let me save to the network drive and I went through settings, I went through control panel, and the control panel is another mess that I just can't make my work through. Maybe that's how Linux users feel when they first see things, but I don't have that with other, like, I've never had that much confusion with Linux, and I don't have that much confusion with macOS either, so it's me and Windows, it's just we don't work well together. As as you well know, because we've had this conversation many a time, I'm used to for the most part, I'm used to the Windows workflow, and so I, when I go over to to Linux, I'm like, uh, as long as it works the way my brain works, then I'm perfectly fine with it. And um, when I go back onto to Windows, of course, there's things that I'm like, no, Linux just does this better. But the core, just where my eye goes to to find things, those kind of things, I'm just from pure muscle memory. It, it's been beat into me from the fact that I grew up with Windows because I've been using Windows since Windows 3.1, you know, Windows 95, Windows 98, XP. So there's a lot of, there's decades of muscle memory in there. So to, for, if something looks completely different, I sometimes get frustrated. Yeah, no, that, that is definitely, we do, we do kind of uh, work of opposite ends here. I will put in the show notes a blog post uh, that helped me set up the shared folder uh, because it works for everything else. It doesn't work for a Word document. I support. I suppose somewhere there's some security policy that prevents you saving Word documents to network drives or whatnot. The way I fixed it, I installed Nextcloud, and now it's just basically it's now uh, I'm now sharing it that way over HTTP because well not HTTP over WebDAV but over the internet internet because it just works better than than shared folders. Uh, I I've very much done that in the past for any time that I was using a virtual machine. Um, I was using Dropbox at the time. Big, we're going back 10, 15 years ago when this was something I would have done semi-regularly. And yeah, rather than arsing around with the, char- the shared folder settings, I just put, put it into Dropbox on either side uh, and then relied on that to synchronize it between the two. Yeah, I, I tried also because obviously University provides, provides Office and that has OneDrive. And I tried adding OneDrive sync I, I tried having the desktop folder synced via OneDrive, 
And then I was looking for it. I couldn't find it because what I didn't realize, OneDrive actually moved. If you add a sync, I thought it was like Nextcloud. Mm-hmm. You add a sync to a folder. It stays put. It's just an extra syncing link somewhere, right? No, 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 oh, no. Oh, oh, what, it, what it'll do is it'll remap your, your desktop folder, your documents folder to to uh, OneDrive. Yeah, yeah that, that, that was a bit of a surprise. And lastly, so this assignment is from... It's for digital forensics, and that uh, so my the assignment assignment is basically well one question from it is uh, use some digital forensic forensic tool to ins- inspect to inspect the data from your web browser from your web browser go to LinkedIn and then check you know there is a lot of data that the web browser leaves on the system inspect that right and. One way of doing this is that you use a tool called uh, uh, SleuthKit, uh, I forgot, uh, Autopsy, SleuthKit Autopsy, right? And one thing that you can do is install Autopsy on Linux and use the vir- whole virtual box as a kind of a source of data for the, for the sleuthing. So you basically mm-hmm. uh, install it on Linux, and then the whole, and then I, then I, then I basically just uh, had to convert the uh, virtual machine image or a copy of it of the Windows uh, guest to a different format and loaded it, and it showed me among other things. You know, when you install Windows and it asks you what's your mother's maiden name, when did you, what was the name of your first pet, what was the name of your school, yeah? All, all that bullshit, yeah. I thought this was sol- This was hashed and salted. I thought it was stored like passwords. These answers are there in plain text, which probably doesn't matter, I don't know. But it's not, you know, like passwords gets get gets hashed. No, no, no system, no modern system ever stores uh plain text passwords, because that would be stupid. But I thought this was treated the same, but it is not treated the same. It's actually, I assume it's because so that you can edit it, or so that you can see it, uh, because people log themselves out of systems all the time, but it was a surprise to me. Yeah, um, so, Project Bluefin. Now, I have to confess, I came across this this afternoon. Uh, literally today so um i do not have much exposure of this other than um there is a 10 minute video that explains it very well and i'll we will include that in the show notes as far as i can tell they're basing it off um the fedora immutable operating system um I, which name escapes me at the moment? You're thinking of Silver Blue. Uh, I think there's like Silver a Blue, Universal yeah. Blue. Yeah, but it's called uh, Project Bluefin. Um, and so it takes Silver Blue. And their philosophy, which I think is an interesting approach, is they abstract um, updates and uh, package management away from the user. They feel the user shouldn't have to worry about any of that. So they say that. Uh, well, at least the the guy who's who is in the YouTube video, which I assume is one of the creators, he seems to be speaking very authoritatively. George Castro, yeah, yeah, about the project. Um, he is saying that like, oh, it it doesn't come up with. There are updates. Would you like to apply these updates? Um, either a GUI pop up or something like that. He just says we just roll and automatically apply them. He says similarly with Flatpak. It's he, he doesn't uh, the, uh, in his philosophy. He's like that shouldn't be up to the user. Um, I mean, I I myself have flat packs on this system that I'm, I'm running, and occasionally if I open up um, KD Discover because I'm on KD, it'll be like, oh, there's updates available. Do you want to wish to apply them? And then I can choose whether I want to apply uh, apply them then or not. But he's abstracting that all away. He's saying it shouldn't matter. It just automatically does it in the background. Uh, the end user shouldn't have to worry about that. Um, that is an interesting approach. And I'm sure, Mike, you probably have thoughts on that. But another thing I want to introduce, he said that is in relation to graphical applications is Flatpak. He says in relation to CLI applications, if you want to install a CLI application, it actually uses Brew. So, um, Brew would be something that people who are, who use macOS will be familiar with, and I've never used it either on macOS or on Linux, so I do not know how well it integrates to Linux. Apparently, very so. If he's if he's introducing this into his distro, and he says, "Yeah, don't need to worry about that." 
brew just takes care of it. Um, so that is another thing that he's relying on is something that is maybe not the standard approach for um, anyone who's familiar with Linux. Um, in either case, either the fact that he's abstracting away the the user's uh, interaction with package management and uh, operating system update management, and also the fact that he's introducing Brew to just run in the background and said, yeah, that, that, that is what I'm familiar with, and that is what is going to be running the show in the background. Mike, I believe you've also watched that video. So um, what, how, what were your initial thoughts on his explanation? I've watched the video. I have before, some time ago, tried uh, Fedora Silverblue, and uh, I had some thoughts on that. This, 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 as you mentioned, there are a few very interesting points. So immutable, this, immutable distro aimed at uh, developers, one of the family of Fedora-related uh, immutable distros. The other one would be Buzzite, which I think is more geared towards gaming, and it uses uh, it uses KDE Plasma. This one is using GNOME. Uh, mm. The first thing that stands out, uh, yeah, Blue. It's not very popular on Linux. It's uh, it's I use it on macOS all the time. People, I, I think I've had much criticism. I don't know because the way I use it, I literally just install things, update things, remove things. And it does that. And that's all I needed to do. And it, that's all it does for me. It works fine. Person necessarily wouldn't need that. So you only need Brew if you are possibly a developer or re- using some kind of command line tools, right? If you are using your workstation for gaming, editing video, creating multimedia, something like that, you might never use these kind of command line applications. For that, Flatpak is... Uh, what he says the choice for GUI applications is is flashback. So and in fact I think what he said there is you open the uh the shop or the uh, you know the software store on the on the desktop and the only thing you have in there is the only source is Flathub. You don't get obviously you don't get system packages uh, but you don't get snaps either. It might be possible to install it in there but he says and I think he said it somewhere in the documentation it was a very interesting quote kind of uh, basically, they said that they are trying to make an interpretation of the old Ubuntu spirit uh, on built on Fedora technology. You know, the Ubuntu spirit was quite opinionated, but geared towards good experience on the desktop. At we are, you know, if you look at Ubuntu when Ubuntu started, it was super. Uh, we are giving you uh, what we think is a good choice for. Uh, for the Ubuntu desktop. So I think they are trying to recreate, oh, that's what he says they are trying to recreate. And yeah, f- I, I, I can't, if, if you think about, give me one source for Linux and applications on, with GUI that is not the AUR, uh, yeah, Flatpak is, is, uh, probably working most of the time. If he's saying, I will give you, uh, I will give you Brew for CLI applications, well, that's fantastic because, at least in my experience, there are a lot of cases where you go to install some command line utility or another from, and, and you obviously go to the, to the GitHub page and it says installation, Windows probably not even there, uh, Mac OS, there is a brew command, Linux, clone the repo, run the build, you know, it, it's a few more mm, commands, but yeah. if you, if you can get, get, get away with it, if you can standardize the work, the experience of installing things between Mac OS, and Linux, with Linux having basically having all the brew packages as all well, whatever you know. I assume there are some that can't be ma- can't work on Linux because they might be requiring some macOS things. But if you can make it work so that you can just use brew for everything, I think that would be fine. I don't know. There are some people who you know. If anybody if anybody has a reason to hate brew, tell me. I think I've had some criticism criticisms before, but uh, I haven't had any myself. Uh, I mean, yeah. Do bear in mind that you are talking about the Linux community. They will fight over anything. <laughs> yeah. So, so. Um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. So for the project Bluefin, they also are. I think the the the, the life cycle there or the the upgrades. They, they they are thinking about not not doing the latest Fedora. Uh, to kind of have a slight still rolling. Uh, or more or less lo- rolling, you know, Fedora's not exactly rolling, but still fairly up-to-date package-wise, but a bit 
slower so that the i think they call it the gts the grand tour grand touring system or something you know where you don't have to because if you you know if you are using a federal based distro you know first thing that you do uh when your system when you log into your system you look wherever your icon for your update manager is and surely almost every day there are some updates at least for me on asahi fedora there's always some updates uh so i think for this one they decided to keep it a bit less changing a bit more stable uh i'm not exactly sure what they what they meant by it uh, of course they said that if you want to use the latest version you still can uh if you want to stay to the federal latest another interesting thing is that you you put in the show notes the contrast with the nexos approach so i tried nexos um I think for another time, like a few times now. And it's too complex for me. And because I don't have the time I can't, and I don't have the justification, uh, I, I always kind of just install something else. Because, uh, you know, if, if I had the time, I might learn it. And, it, and if I had a use case specifically for NixOS, OS, uh, I might learn it. But I, you know, uh, currently that's not the case. This might be interesting. They are thinking about releasing, or they are, they, he, he said they are also going to release um, M1 and M2 images. So I could put it on my MacBook uh, that currently runs Asahi. So they would use obviously the Asahi kernel and build uh, Fedora, uh, sorry, and build Bluefin ISO out of that. Uh, another thing is that they can, that you can, so my biggest issue with these things is when you start things when you need things that are not within the scope of how this you know within the main kind of stream of this working so i need i cannot work without remapping my keys certain keys on my keyboard are in different places and none of the built-in layout editors in gnome or kde do the job well for me so i need a specific utility called input input remapper that works super for this on XOS, hmm. every time I would, every time it would go to sleep, I would have to reload the configuration manually. That was a bit annoying. But yeah, I get, I get what you're going from. Is the what well, I guess when I put in the the contrast with um, uh, NixOS is uh, I feel that NixOS anyone who's going to use NixOS or anyone that NixOS is targeted towards is very much a uh, I would imagine somebody who gets hands on it's the next OS. There's it's a config file. Anything that you want to tweak, it's in a config file. This I t- I thought it would be interesting to to contrast with that. For, so that's the reason why I kind of put that post that question in it. Is this is gonna the opposite? It's abstracting away the user environment in that. Um, so that I guess that's what, where he's coming from from so from an end user's point of view. Oh yeah, I absolutely agree that this would be it's more intuitive to me. It would be more intuitive to me to to pick up. Um, uh, whether me as a as a Linux user puts a put on my Linux user hat on one of the reasons I like the fact that I'm in Linux and I'm in the Linux community is. Because I can tweak and change things, um, and they're, this is taking that away from me. So maybe not for me necessarily, but maybe a developer who just puts it on a secondary computer. So their main computer is their tweaky computer, or or their computer that they want to game on, or do anything like that, or do their hobbies, their their anything that is outside of their development work cycle. And they have another computer that is a ded- dedicated development computer. I think this is this distro is targeting that, as in I can put it in a drawer for uh, two or three months if I'm if I'm not working on on any development really heavily or anything like that, and then in two or three months' time, I open up the computer, turn it on, and it just works, and I can just continue on. There's no you have. 200 million um, updates that are due uh, and this may break your computer. Something like Arch, it would be very much a risk that if you put a computer into a drawer for two to two to three weeks or longer put it, you went on, on holidays for a month came back and then opened up the computer again that computer may not survive the 
the the amount of updates that are due for that computer. Um, that is a consideration if you want something that is just solid and will just work. But yeah, from his video, I just uh, watched it and I thought it was a, it was a novel approach and I do not know how much traction he, he's going to get uh, or they are going to get. I'm presuming it's, not, it's more than one, just one, one person. But it just I certainly found it interesting. I just one thing, I wonder how... So we are kind of treating it as if it was not configurable, but just because it's immutable, that doesn't mean that you can't configure user settings, right? So let's say that the uh, Buzzite distro it's probably not configurable, configurable because GNOME isn't that much configurable. Although it gets you, you can get extensions on this on Bluefin as well. Very much so. In 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 his demonstration, he says like we we have the extension manager by default, and they the it, it's an opinionated like he says the default um uh, resource manager or task manager or however you want to say it, the one that is built into GNOME. They don't use they use something else because they said we think it. it kind of looks cool it looks better and presents the information in a, in a different way they've made that decision they don't use uh, gnome terminal by default they've they've have an opinionated uh, a opinion about which terminal they've picked and but then it's not just a case of we we picked this because and you're like okay no they, he very much in the in the course of the video explains why they picked that which i thought he did in a very good way is i forget the tool but he's he demonstrated a tool that he is like yeah you, you can run uh, an ubuntu instance in the command line you could run uh, like open source or something like that he says yeah we we ship this tool and we ship this terminal because it integrates well with that tool so and and then he shows like in the in the terminal he, literally there's a drop down and he says yeah um i want to use uh, my ubuntu instance now and it just opens up a new tab and then boom he's in ubuntu because that's another thing so he said uh brew for a uh, command line uh, flat pack for gui and if you really need something that is that is in- inaccessible in any other way apart from getting let's say from ubuntu uh, repos or something or something like this you use distrobox which is uh, you know that that's uh, that's been around for a few years i think now and it's a super great project mm-hmm. i've used it a lot but they use um Something called Box Buddy, which I've never seen, which is like a GUI where you where you select uh, and create the containers, and you can you can st- I think it allows you to store the containers as well as applications. I know DistroBox has got that power; you can actually export the whole image even for GUI applications. Uh, but this is uh, this looks like there's a GUI wrapper or GUI application for you to control these things. And yeah, as you said, the con- the terminal called Ptixis. Or is, I don't know if the P is silent. Maybe it's Texas. I don't know. The the con the terminal is geared towards container uh, containerized containerized tasks. Also, they kind of build the whole uh, Bluefin project as cloud native uh, Linux distribution. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but there is a lot of containerization uh, going on in there, which has been again the case in Fedora generally for the last few years. Uh, I'm 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 sure they're they're going to absolutely love that we spent about uh, however long fifteen twenty minutes talking about their ten minute long video, but um, <laughs> his 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 present presentation is quite well. Like it's it's he um, he gets a lot of information across in that ten minutes or so. So um, hence why we took a while to kind of unpack it. Mike, so you have uh, got a rocket book notepad. Can you explain that? So I saw it first because my colleague my colleague got one for Christmas and uh, basically yeah, it is an erasable notebook that you can write on in hand obviously and it comes with an app and you can scan it and I saw it we saw it in in Eason's, uh yesterday when we went to uh, when we went to the city center and uh, to to explain anyone who's who's outside of Ireland Eason's is is our big chain book and stationery supplier. In, in Ireland, yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, they had it. It's a. Uh, it cost, I think, thirty five quid. It comes with a pen. Is one of. The, it's a pilot pen, uh, but it has to be an erasable gel pen. Basically, uh, the pages are either plastic or paper covered in plastic. You can write on it, and then it. Then you just take a cloth with water and uh, wipe it clean. And it comes with an application. You scan it for both iOS and Android. So you scan it, and uh, you can share it 
with email or uh, 10 kind of cloud providers, uh, the providers are all the proprietary ones like Google Drive, uh, iCloud, uh, Dropbox, and so on. There is a way of um, bridging together. So Nextcloud, unfortunately, isn't uh, there. They are thinking about Nextcloud, and I think the better Android application has Nextcloud uh, integration because somebody oh. pointed it out to them uh, that Nextcloud would be nice. There is a way you can send, obviously, because you can send email, you can send an email, and you can you can set which emails to send it to so you can send an email and then have some kind of a bridging um you bridging imap uh, imap to next cloud script that could run on your next cloud server or anywhere really so it is it is not impossible i haven't gone to set it up set it up yet but basically it has got some nice cities if you can do if you can manage nice uh, handwriting it can you can get it ocr uh the notes uh for me that's um Probably not an option. I I scribble too badly. But yeah, it 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 it's basically a notebook with about thirty plastic pages in. It comes with different sizes, and yeah. You're you're saying you're going to make a a, a doctor's handwriting legible. Look oh legible. yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. My handwriting is terrible. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, the idea is great. Uh, the idea that you be, be, that you can just write in hand. And uh, you don't have to just keep throwing reams of paper. And as well, you can scan the things and uh, keep it in one place. The application is quite good. You can, uh, at the bottom of the pages, there are a little symbols and you can set up the sharing free symbols. So you can, you can mark each page differently and say, this page I want to, I want to send only to iCloud. This, this one I want to send to my Evernote and, uh, and Gmail and so on. Uh, so the, the pages are also, they have got black boundary. Uh, I okay. assume that's for, uh, for better scanning. I have not tried, um, actually just uh, scanning a piece of paper with the application. I assume it would still maybe work or maybe not because there's no QR code. But yeah, it is, it is an interesting concept. You know, for people, I don't know how kids learn these days. Uh, if they uh, do kids still write in hand, I'm not sure. I literally don't know, but I, I assume they do. But I'm told that for people who were writing primarily with in hand, in cursive, when they were at school, writing things down aids your memory. Yeah. So, so you you remember if you are taking notes, you remember better if 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 you if they are handwritten than if they are than if you type it. I'm not sure to which extent that's actually true. I'm not sure if what what else it depends on. But uh, yeah, it might. It it is in, also. It's just in many cases, it's just faster to write than type, and definitely to sketch. Uh, from for, for my studies when I was in academia, it's it's the additional form of repetition, and I I don't think I consciously was thinking about that at the time. But I'm and kind of retroactively um, thinking back. <laughs> So, uh, apparently you have gotten an Apple Watch. Oh, scratch that. OnePlus, sorry. OnePlus, <laughs> OnePlus Watch 2, to be precise. D- 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 yeah, d- different ecosystem. Um, I d- I, um, if I was to get an Apple Watch, it would be an extremely expensive paperweight because it wouldn't, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't operate. I'm not in that ecosystem. Um, so, I have a, a, a love-hate relationship with um, smartwatches and I have spent more money than I would like to admit on smartwatches over the years. And I don't mean just over the last uh, year or two, I'm talking about possibly over the last decade or something like that. Uh, 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 you live and learn and it's um, it's all personal learning experience. But that's a long way to say that my latest purchase <laughs> of my uh, apparent uh, addiction to to uh, finding out um, how well I can interact with smartwatches is a OnePlus Watch 2. So the OnePlus Watch 2 is running the latest Wear OS, which is Wear OS 4, I think. And ultimately, the reason why it made me pull the trigger was, one, it was relatively inexpensive. Uh, what is it, relatively inexpensive? This was probably about €300, Euro, so um, it's not your quite your Apple Watch Pro freaking levels. But it's not exactly inexpensive. I will admit that 300 euro, not any, everyone can spend 300 euro just on a whim. Uh, what sold it for me and the reason why I I was holding off on smartwatches for a very long time is 
battery life. I do not, I charge my phone every single evening. I do not want to charge my watch every single evening. Particularly since I do want to avail of the sleep tracking feature of it as well. And what's the point in sleep tracking if you're def- if the watch is off your wrist and is in the corner charging? And people, he, I've talked to people who use smartwatches and they say, oh, um, that's fine. It doesn't take that long to re- fully recharge the, the watch. So you take it off when you're uh, going for a shower or something like that. Um, that I could potentially um, have that as part of my routine but that would mean altering my routine. I don't tend to take my... Because I have a normal waterproof watch and I just tend to leave it on and if it's in the shower, that's fine. So it's not part of my routine to take off my watch and and then I'd have to think about it and remind myself to charge the watch while I'm in the shower or something like that. Uh, and this reportedly will get three to four days battery life on regular use. And the way they do that is it has a hybrid processor in it. So the original OnePlus watch was using their own operating system. I do not know if it was proprietary or, or not, but it wasn't Wear OS. Um, and it was running on a, a much lower power processor in order to get the, the battery life goals that they wanted. So this is kind of a hybrid between the two is you get the smartwatch features, you get your full Wear OS, you can download all of the smartwatch applications you you want off the Play Store, should you want to, and it will only light up the more power-hungry processor that was required for for Wear OS periodically, when it actually needs to. Other than that, it will go back down to the to the upper, other um to the other lower powered processor and I believe one of the updates and the reason why it's running uh, Wear OS 4 out of the gate is uh, it, Google has kind of been working in, with this and I'm sure this is this is just the first out of the gate I'm sure this won't be the other, the only example of this of this hybrid uh, CPU or hybrid processor uh, configuration is window uh, is Google has, has now built it into Wear OS that it full it natively supports this dual processor that is a bit of a, a long take on uh, why i got it but yeah i've literally unboxed it earlier on uh, unboxed it earlier on today so this is hot off the presses i haven't had much time to interact with it but um seems to be perfectly fine um i've been looking at the battery life and the battery life doesn't seem to have diminished that time that much despite the fact that i've been using it for a couple of hours so i i would believe that it would would last the advertised three or four days of battery life and they say that if you if you go into like low power mode and i believe the lower power mode is it's switching back into whatever the old legacy operating system is and only relying on the super uh, less powerful um cpu that you probably could get two weeks off it so let's say if you uh, go off on your holidays and you forget your charger it's not the case of you're going to be without any kind of function um i i think it it will still do step tracking and it'll still display the time and it'll still show you rudimentary notifications but then that's it it doesn't do any of the advanced wear os features um but yeah i've 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 included in the show notes uh, other examples of of watches i've used in the past um and they're the latest version of them not just the um the version that i necessarily used um as alternatives, but um, Mike, <laughs> what is your take on the whole smartwatch? Have you ever used a smartwatch? Do you have any? Does it appeal to you in any way? Or it? So I, uh, I've never had one. Uh, the reason why I have never had one is well, there's a few, right? First, I am a bit uh, clumsy, so I'd be worried if it was something. I, I you know, my watch. Uh, the one that I wear regularly is about was about I think about hundred euros. A regular smartwatch is about the price that you said, and it it, it doesn't matter if it's Apple Watch uh, or or any other or any any Android Wear watch these days three four hundred euros. So I'd be worried that I smash it basically, especially since as you said as well, if I had one, I would want to be using the uh, you know the sleep tracking functionality on it, and uh, I'm not sure if I yeah, uh, but. That I think I will overcome. I will eventually get one when, especially since, uh, you know, the health aspect of these things is getting, 
is getting more and more sophisticated and i will want that you know it's um I have a family history of uh, heart issues. I want to be kind of notified. And I like the idea of having a, basically a health monitor. How good they are or not, I don't know. I think they are, you know, on, on, across the board, they are probably getting better. Uh, and it's not as acute yet. So basically, it's my roundabout way of saying, no, I, I haven't got, a, I haven't had one, but I will get to it eventually. I'm not sure which one. Probably depends on which uh ecosystem I will be part when i when i get that uh i do like the uh, the apple watches but uh, that's just because i like the looks i like the looks of these of this i'm looking at the website that you shared in the notes i like the looks of this uh the kind of crown that is offset to the side and with the button on the other side with the you know it it, it looks very slick um and uh yeah so for me it will be basically when i need it and specifically what functionality it offers it will be you know as opposed to for example mobile phone uh mobile phone these days they are kind of the same they all have the same functionality not necessarily the same degree of uh of functionality you know there are better ones and worse ones and some things so some phones are better at one things and some phones are better at others but watches i think you can kind of still they can still kind of still differentiate at how good are they are at certain you know what what kind of things they prioritize so yes uh i have not yet looked into it uh one thing so i will um uh, i put some additional watches in in the show notes and just give you a brief rundown of how they compare and contrast so uh the one that i've i've got is running wear os uh, neither of the additional ones that i i do run wear os so if wear os is your is your goal you want the the extra like all the the hot freaking um applications and everything like that then you need a wear os uh, watch um wear os watches typically up until now are have been the one two days at a very stretch um type of battery life which is the reason why i've kind of dismiss, dismissed them in the past um one that i've um the literally the one that i was wearing up until i switched over to this one is the garmin instinct 2 solar um, the solar one specifically, you can wear, you can get a non-solar one, and I, I believe it is actually slightly cheaper. Um, again, uh, my whole thing is I want the most battery life possible. Um, the Instinct to Solar was getting me between twenty and thirty days battery life, with everything. Um, all all regular things turned on um like this they wouldn't be monitoring my gps 24 7 like you if you turn on gps needless to say it's going to seriously kill your battery life but i mean just your day-to-day um of functionality of it doing step tracking it doing sleep tracking it doing um heart rate monitoring it does all of that and it'll still last the 20 or 30 days the compromise is that it's a black and white non-touch screen screen so if if that is what you want and if you want something that is very robust it just doesn't have the touch screen it's black and white uh but it does have a solar charge functionality. They they claim, and um, in Ireland I've not had much opportunity to test this, but you can flick through their, their faces um, using the buttons, go left and right, and eventually you will get to a screen where it's like we're measuring the amount of, of solar energy that the watch is pick, picking up at the moment. So you actually can track it and everything like that. But they say that if you're in a very... Uh, sunny bright and sunny environment like spain or california or something like that that the the battery or the will effectively keep going indefinitely in other words uh like three four hours of you walking around going on a hike during the day would be enough to charge the 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 battery for that day so you effectively get unlimited amount of of charge if you're if you're doing that failing that then you could just charge it regularly and it charges for about an hour and you get 30 days <laughs> um which is was really cool uh um and i've also included a maze fit a maze fit is good uh, the fact that the 
they do a lot of the functionality that you would expect from the smartwatches, the touchscreen, its color touchscreen, everything like that. It's running its own operating system. It's not running Wear OS. Um, but because of that, it it also can do the whole tweaks of it's a lower powered um, processor. Um, the operating system itself is probably much, much leaner. They get some pretty um, amazing battery life figures a, couple, a week at least uh, maybe a week or two out of some of their their uh, watches and have used them in the past. So all of these are about compromise, um, whether you want to wear a Wes, um, whether you want um, something that is completely the old school and is just like wearing a, a an old school Casio, uh, in which case go with Garmin, uh, or if you want a kind of a happy medium between the two, um, possibly a maze fit would be a good option. Um Amazfit, as far as I know, are a sub brand of uh, uh, Xiaomi. I believe they were spun off Xiaomi. Uh, do not know if they're still under one hundred percent ownership of them, or if they've been spun off to their own independent thing. But just so you know, the origins of it, uh, whether that bothers you or not, the um, do you know, uh, Xiaomi had their whole Mi Band fitness tracking uh, movement for a while, and I believe Amazfit is uh, a spin off of that. Um, yeah, bit of a long one, but um, just a, my my experience of going through various different smartwatches. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll see, and I will uh, if if anything interesting comes up, or um, I will mention it again on another op- another podcast episode in the future. If nothing interesting comes up, just assume that it's I'm fairly happy with it as all uh, fine and dandy, and I've no reason why uh, to reason no reason to think why it wouldn't be. No. That that yeah. Well, congratulations on your no, on your new on your new watch. I'm a, I'm a new shiny that I've now sp- uh, spent a lot of money on. <laughs> well, if it if it you know if it makes you happy, uh, and if it if it if it adds value to your life, you, you can't. Yeah, it's, it's, I have the disposable income, so why not? Why not treat myself? Exactly. Alrighty, that seems like a nice place to wrap things up. I have been Connor, and I have been joined by Mike. As always. If you want to email us, we're show at linuxlads.com. So um, if you do want to give us feedback uh, in long form, do it on the form or via email. Or if you just want to join us and hang out with us, join us on Telegram. Alrighty, bye. Ciao. I uh, was not prepared when I said that, so I'll give me a second while I bring up the show notes. <laughs> You should have said, like, yeah, that's a good time to wrap it up. Bye. <laughs> okay, that seems like a good time as any to wrap things up. Um, I have been Mike. Uh, I have been Mike. <laughs> that just shows you how tired I am. Yeah, same.